Hello and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. We're so glad you could join us today for this program, Changing American Beliefs About Death. And now I would like to introduce today's faculty presenter, Dr. Monica Williams-Murphy, an emergency physician with Huntsville Hospital. Welcome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, all of you for taking time out of your busy afternoon to come and talk about what I believe is one of the most important aspects of health care, the end of life. And I also want to thank the Alabama Department of Public Health for hosting and producing this lecture. So thank you all for coming. So it's my distinct honor and pleasure to talk to you today about one of the few absolutes in public health, and that is 100% of us are born and 100% of us will die. Now culturally, we do a fantastic job of talking about birth, right? Planning for it and celebrating it. We have baby showers and, and, and extensive cultural celebrations focused on bringing that new baby home, right? Now in contrast, we do a terrible job of talking about death and dying. We do an awful job of preparing for it. Few people do. And then it is the rare person who can celebrate the end of life. I believe that we need to change that. I don't have the eternity pill and neither do you, so we've got to come up with a better way. So as an emergency physician, I was trained in what I call the ER instinct of medicine, which is if you're 8, 80, or 108, and you roll into the ER and you're dying, my job is to save your life. That's what I was trained to do. So if you come in and you're dying, I will intubate you, shock you, <coughs> perform CPR, put a central line in you, crack your chest if I have to, give you blood, pressors, and antibiotics, and put you in the ICU, all without blinking an eye. That's what I was trained to do, the ER instinctive medicine. And that was fine for the majority of my career. I did that without questioning on any age group and any person who came in until about five years ago, I had what I will describe as a crisis of conscience, a moral crisis, if you will, for those who were terminally ill or near the end of life. I remember a couple of cases that really changed my mind about how I practice medicine. The first was about a 90-year-old great-grandmother who came in, and she weighed 80 pounds and was covered in bed sores and had a feeding tube, and she came from a skilled nursing facility, and she was dying. She was taking her last breaths in front of me. And I frantically checked through all of her paperwork that came and it said full code. At that moment she lost a pulse and it was my job to resuscitate her based on that order. And as I crushed her ribs beneath my hands and looked at her little frail body, I looked at my nurse and said, my gosh, what are we doing? This is wrong. We should be holding her hand saying thank you, I love you and goodbye. How do we get to the point as a nation where we think this is the best thing to do for this woman? Let's imagine that it's 100 years ago when death was still a natural event, not a medicalized event. So let's say it's 100 years ago and you're walking along a creek path and you see your Uncle Wilbur. He's an 88-year-old gentleman and he appears to be dead. He's unresponsive there along the creek path. What do you do? It's a hundred years ago. What do you do? Shake him? He's unresponsive? He's dead? A hundred years ago you would gather Uncle Wilbur and you would take him home and he would lie in state for two to three days. The community and family members would make food and you would come and tell stories about Uncle Wilbur, you know. He could tell a good joke. <laughs> so you see death was not reversible a hundred years ago and considered to be natural. Death was understood and managed by the lay people. Okay, so fast forward to 2013. Let's say this afternoon you're walking along Main Street after this presentation, okay? And you see your Uncle Wilbur. He's unresponsive on the ground. He appears to be dead. What do you do? Call 911, okay? What else do you do? Start CPR. Very good. All right. So we're attempting to reverse death. It's 2013. We can do that. And people expect us. It's the default expectation of the system. And then TV portrays CPR and intensive care unit medicine all wrong. Of course, you guys have watched the show ER and said, no, they're doing it wrong. So here's the way CPR is portrayed. So a couple of small chest compressions and a little shock, and the patient wakes up and asks for a Coke and a smoke. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way, okay? So how in this modern world, this modern technological world, can we regain this? Well, I'll tell you, it's a challenge, but I do know something. I know that 
when someone knows they're dying, when some doctor has had the guts to say, Mrs. Williams, you're at the end of life. You may have three months to live. In the sure face of coming death, an emotional window of opportunity opens that seems limited or unavailable at other times of life. Each touch of a grandchild's hand has new power and meaning. Love can be shared more easily than at other times. And grudges can fall away in insignificance. I mean, why hold a grudge? You're dying, right? It's time to get rid of that. So we shouldn't lose opportunities to say these kinds of things. One of the saddest cases of my career involved a young boy who had a terrible trauma and I tried my best to save his life and failed. I even held his heart in my hands trying to massage it to bring him back and I could not and I was devastated by that. But I was most devastated by his father who laid down on the hospital floor and said there are things I never told him. I never got to say goodbye. Don't ever let there be things that you never told someone. You should tell the story of your life, the things you've done good and bad, where you were on the road and fell off the road. These stories are very important. The definition of a legacy is a gift that transforms the life of the receiver. And your story of your life is your personal legacy to your unborn great-grandchildren. Sadly, too many Americans are underprepared. So what happens is, if it falls on us to make the decision for someone else, it becomes a huge guilt burden, particularly if we have never heard firsthand what that person would want or would not want in such a situation. I have known people who have spent the rest of their own lives wringing their hands about the rightness and wrongness of a decision they made for mother because they never heard from mother's mouth what she wanted or did not want. How you respond to health care providers who may think your message kind of borderlines on euthanasia. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> well, I tell, I tell people all the time, I say, first of all, um, if you came to this lecture out of fear that this was somehow a pro-Dr. Kevorkian thing, I'm sorry to disappoint you. But at the same time, if people out of fear on the opposite position believes that my message is somehow the fine print in President Obama's Affordable Care Act, I can assure them that is not the case also. So my position on euthanasia is that I do not support euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide. Neither does the American Medical Association. But I do support us gaining control over our end-of-life pathways. I think that we can do a better job. I do not believe that physician-assisted suicide is the answer to that, however. I'm morally opposed to it.